session. Tina, thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. Um, so I'm going to get started. Um, to say that this has been a collective effort is is um, an understatement. Um, sort of the big key drivers in this uh, student teacher partnership are myself, Prof Cook, um, Dr. Mukachane, who's joined us, um, Dr. Bukino, who is currently on sabbatical, and uh, one of our student leaders, um, uh, Elena, who is currently unable to attend today. So this partnership is just that it's it's collecting people along the way because it's such an important topic, um, which is why I wanted to start by saying that um, please do come forward and assist us in this process. It's by no means exclusive and certainly uh, um, something that we want to carry uh, faculty wide. So let me just jump in and say this has been a series in three parts. Um, where we looked at initially the role of doctor role modeling in the professional development of leaders, what tools exist to assess professionalism. And today we're going to look at a way forward with the introduction of our student uh, proposed student teacher professionalism partnership. So in the first week, um, we asked faculty members to zoom in on their training spaces and themselves and see what their role was in role modeling professional behavior and, and how they were faring in that area and how receptive they are to feedback and do we practice what we preach? Um, the second week, we looked at some tools that exist in the kit for how to teach and assess professionalism. And, and we created a, a Google Drive, which I'm posting here because it is by no means exclusive of some tools that exist uh, that are, are able to be shared. So if you'd like to be added to this portfolio, please just put your name in the chat and I'll add you at the end of the session. Um, but today we really are looking at um, the introduction of, of a proposed student teacher professionalism partnership um, that we're hoping will do a few things that we needed to do. But let's, let's just look today at sort of the, the outline of, of what we'd like to cover. Um, and I think in all of our conversations, when, when we started this conversation, we, we started up front by saying that um, there was a problem with the culture in our faculty. In, in the way that students and teachers were interacting with each other and how it was quite a negative narrative fraught with distrust and um, quite, to be quite frank, uh, very toxic in certain spaces. And so today, uh, the first point I'd like to start at is to look at sort of what culture shift are we we looking at? What are we aiming for as a collective? And within that is is what is the ideal scenario that we're aiming for when we're training our students and, and what are the ideals that our faculty have to have to get to get us to this ideal and uh, prof cook's going to introduce to us uh, some elements of workplace-based assessment with the uh, introduction of the a rich framework and then we're going to look at how to get to this culture shift that we want um, with a, a way forward after these conversations um, Prof Cook highlighted, you know, we've had many conversations on the side before we come to these sessions, and it is certainly the analogy that I used when I spoke to my colleagues was was we're building the boat as we row it down the river, and uh, it has honestly been an experience where we're kind of forging a pathway here where none exists, and I think it was quite important yesterday because we highlighted that um, most of our concerns around professional behavior came from the curriculum space about interacting with students in assessment events and in the context where we train them. But ultimately, it is reflecting a culture that is an issue. Um, and when we address these kinds of areas, you cannot look at one area. You've got to look at all of them independently. Uh, but a big area is really the, the culture. And what I'd like to put on screen, what this is, is, you know, when we started this project, we we uh, brought it to the GEM3 students in the medical program, and we brought it there out of convenience. It was really um, a, a, a space that I was very comfortable with as a clinician, and it was a, a transition year where our GEM students go from being quite very much lecture-based into a very clinical environment, um, and it seemed like a good place to start. Uh, really, it was just a, a, a starting point. Um, and what we did with uh, on the days we met the entire class and we had um, some uh, key senior members from faculty in the space, not all, but some key members. And we had a very frank and vulnerable conversation with the students where 
we ask them to come up with their strengths and weaknesses that they bring into the program coming into the clinical training years, what their concerns were and what the expectations were of their training environment. And then we did the same for faculty and, and that's what was generated on the day, uh, just sort of as a starting point. And, and the thought was that faculty, they bring a passion and enthusiasm for what they do. They desire to improve the program and service delivery as a consequence a mount and a wealth of teaching experience with an intent and a desire to develop the best version of the doctors that these students are training to be. Some identified weaknesses of the space was the frustration with the messiness and the unpredictability of the clinical space. The availability of teachers and really honestly difficult human interactions where a lot of unprofessional behavior was being seen both from students and from staff members and this sort of tarring of students with the same brush and view, viewing the students as a burden um, with language barriers brought up. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list. It was just a starting point. And there was sort of an expectation that the students would come on board and be apprentices and workers with us um, in that particular environment. And we did the same with students and we had conversations with students about what they wanted and what they expected and, and we met with them two or three weeks back and it was quite jarring to see that the worst case scenario had popped up again and, and all those behaviours were being seen again by our students. So I guess the question that I'm going to start with today is to say what sort of culture are we aiming for in our faculty? If the one we have is truly not what we want it to be, then what are we what do we want it to be if it's not what we want? Um, and I'd like to at this point just uh, switch out and uh, just have a uh, reflective space now where I'm going to document some thoughts that we might have. And I'm just going to share that written text uh, with you, you colleagues. Uh, let me just get my tech organized if you don't mind. Um, so for me now is, is just thinking of what culture changes would we like to see um, at this point? Um, are, are there any thoughts around the things that we're aiming for that perhaps we don't have at the moment? Any ideas here? Richard, perhaps you can come in there for me. Yes, certainly. Um, let me let me say that that the 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 matter of trust uh, is is um, is for me the <clears throat> the the big one. Um, that that if we, if we could have measures or initiatives or actions or approaches or tools that could try to 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 influence the trust between students and and trainers um is 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 important um and i i might say as well that that <clears throat> you know as we, when you talk about faculty with a small f um and as as faculty with a small f get more and more senior, they get integrated within in sort of and identified with a as as faculty with a big F, and 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 therefore representative of its and and therefore distant from the the um, from the students it, if, if from from many students on the ground. Um, so we might have our individual spaces as seniors in which we can try to develop trust with with the individual groups of students but but the overarching culture is of of trust is lacking um and and that for me would be a would is is an important starting point there'll be many others that colleagues can ref, that can add thank you richard i uh, absolutely agree with that sentiment what i've also pasted on this page is is comments that are coming out of the chat and that students need a sense of belonging with equal responsibility. And we need to speak, shift from speaking to one uh, to engaging with. Um, 
I'm just adding another comment that's coming here in the chat and please feel free to pop those in here. Um, because I will just paste them as we go. Any other thoughts around this as I'm placing these these things? If you had a wish list for for what you wish could be that currently maybe isn't or or is but is not on a large enough level, uh, maybe that's another way of looking at it. Um, from my side, uh, this shared responsibility um, in the training program is is a huge area for me, where um, students and faculty take on responsibility. Um, for for getting students and faculty to the point where, it, you know, everybody's in it for the same thing. I hope uh, students enter what, whichever health professions program they're in to become that professional that they want to be. And we, as trainers in those spaces, want them to become that. But it sometimes feels as we as if we're butting heads and we're fighting with each other. But actually, we want the same thing. And so I don't know if phrasing it as equal responsibility is right, or if maybe there's another way to to word it. Um, Another culture that I would love in our faculty is is one of um, having a, a shared focus of, of what we're wanting. Are, are we all on the same page in terms of our goals as a faculty and students? I'm, I'm not sure if that goal or that ideal is is the same thing or is known or even exists. Um, OK, I'm going to keep popping in the concepts that are coming in here. In here. On the chat. Uh, please feel free to raise your hands as we go. Sorry, I'm just going to take names out of that. And um, I'm seeing safety, I'm seeing mentorship and shared values for patient care. Um, I see, a, a, yeah, no, no hands up at that stage. Um, any other thoughts here? I think for me as faculty, what I would love from faculty and, and love from the culture is, is that we are always willing to do better because I think um, we tend to get stuck in our ways of being and our ways of doing things. And it's quite hard to move ourselves, certain individuals, departments. Um, we, we're not a very agile collective and i think um you know fostering growth and and change for the collective for the good of of our shared goal is is what i'm advocating for um i see in the chat dialogue so conversation communication um i'm going to see a safe and inclusive culture um uh, where we advocate for each other sounds wonderful can i just say <laughs> um all these things that we we wish we had um trust students belonging with equal responsibility uh speaking to shifting from speaking to to engaging with culture of doing and solution driven mentorship with shared values for patient care safe and inclusive where we advocate for each other a culture where we can speak to each other and are responsive to each other's experiences. And I think there's a lot on this page that we can work with. Um, and in, in any of our spaces that perhaps we have seen bits of these coming through. But I'm, I'm hearing that they, and I know I'm preaching to the converted in terms of the colleagues that are in this room, um, that, that this wish list, um, is, it, is it so unattainable? I'm not sure. I'm just going to keep adding in here. Um, and uh, I'm going to just pause for a moment and allow us to just reflect on this list and see if there's any comments.
Anyone want to add verbal or written comment here? Yes, go ahead, Aviwe. Um, I've just been thinking about uh, how I think education sometimes has perhaps like a a, a, a tendency of, of shaping and molding individuals to become a certain type of like ideology, depending on what you're studying. And I often wonder, you know, when we talk about, we would love for students to feel heard and seen, that often does mean uh, uh, to a certain extent, their individuality or how they express themselves also needs to be considered in a part of that journey even though, yes, there's the professionalism aspect that will then merge with that. Um, but I, I think it's so important for, for people and students to be able to express themselves because along the way they end up, it's very easy to, to forget yourself when you when you becoming a certain profession um, and, and you have to take on perhaps new values. So, yeah, I, I think there has to be that merging of that personal identity, but also with the professional identity, but to make that work somehow. Thank you, Aviwe. I do love that because I, I think it's true. Often when students enter into health professions pro programs, they come in with a certain set of values and ideals that they're aiming for. And they leave those behind in the program so that they can fit into a mold perhaps that requires a bit of work, this mold. Um, I'm looking at the comment here from Yandisa, aiming for a culture that dispels the myth that doctors are made of steel and they should sacrifice themselves even when they are depleted. So a culture of aiming for doing the absolute for the patient, even if it is at the cost to the individual. And I think these are the same things said in a slightly different way. And I love what is coming up in this space. And, you know, as I look at these things, I feel a sort of a lifting of the heaviness of the task, trying to address a, a culture that needs a bit of work. And Mantua, go ahead. Um, just, just, just to say, um, I like what Yandisa said, but it's also not just about the individual but also um, where you end up making other people feel this way and in that terrible way for the sake of the patient. So sacrificing everyone else for the sake, for the sake of the patient. Thank you, Mantua. I'm seeing a comment here from Richard, a culture in which the vulnerability of wanting to be better, to be more, to grow, but not being there yet is acceptable and understood. By, by four students and clinicians and faculty. So aiming for vulnerability to allow for growth. That's kind of how I'm reading that. I'm just gonna pop it in here. Oops. Fix that. So I think I'm, I'm just gonna do some tech quickly and switch to um, a presenter mode so that we can continue this conversation. But I think that we, we're getting the juices flowing in what we're aiming for. I, th I think we've all agreed that there's a problem. <laughs> I don't think there's anyone that doesn't agree that there's a problem within the faculty culture and the behavior of our students and the behavior of faculty. And interestingly, these concepts uh, were also discussed yesterday by our collective group and, and, and we came up with thoughts around what the culture we are aiming for could be. And a lot of that is mirrored in what is said today. Um, and the word that came up, which which really spoke to me, um, was the concept that everyone is important in the training environment. That maybe we've been pushing our focus to give the best possible patient care, and sometimes that is at all cost, cost to the student, cost to the doctors, and perhaps that is not a good place to focus. Perhaps we should be focusing on a space where everyone is important, in line with the, the ideas around Ubuntu. And, and the concept of making the best version of yourself in these training spaces so that if you are the best you can be, the patient will automatically benefit from your best. And learning as a collective where we, we foster a growth mindset and generate meaningful learning experiences. 
and a lot of what was said in our discussions on the side it's kind of come up again here and it's lovely to see that these thoughts are pretty similar um and i guess you know when we look at these spaces i mean what are we aiming for what is the sort of ideal scenario uh, is the ideal scenario trying to see what are the features of the ideal healthcare worker and aiming at all costs to get there or what are the ideal teacher const uh, teacher features in order to get these students to be the ideal healthcare worker you know and we we have documents and i'm going to reflect just in the medical faculty on something um called the Witz doctor which is really how how we envisioned at a, as a faculty what we want our our product to to be able to do be and look like you know and it, it covered a whole bunch of things um and at this point i'm i'm going to hand over to richard because we're going to introduce a concept here um of of maybe a potential direction we could be looking at um so richard i'm going to bring you in here um to look at, at this concept tina thank you and and colleagues this this is uh, this is something um that we're currently working on within the the um, postgraduate uh, in med programs for the school of clinical medicine um in which we we it really uh, apropos the, the the topics that tina has very competently taken us through this speaks to curriculum as opposed to context i beg your pardon as opposed to culture but really without a culture um uh, being improved we're going to find it very difficult to achieve what i i wish to summarize here and that is that that for for a long time now our assessments within the postgraduate space and indeed the undergraduate space um, have been about looking retrospectively to the left of the slide as to whether the student has mastered master has shown mastery of the content taught in courses and rotations and in in a way is has is is somewhat independent in that sense from the from the clinical space and the the workplace based training and assessment we're recognizing now that that the the high stakes exam once off high stakes exam um, even in the college space is 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 not the most transformative equitable or indeed um, valid and reliable method of assessment and we're moving towards a more workplace based assessment uh, we're moving towards more workplace based assessment around a programmatic look at individuals in in multiple in multiple um, small stakes assessments that cumulatively form a picture by way of multiple pixels of the students of the students competence now that we've spoken about for some time now but really the way forward is being recognized that we're not going to be just looking at the at the the the, the competence around mastery of the content and the skills and the procedures but rather um, if we're doing a, making a, a decision about a, a registrar for for them to take on the, the title and the registration and the responsibility to be, say, a paediatrician the following morning, can we entrust them to with with being able to to assume the the responsibility for the individual units of professional practice that are expected of a of a paediatrician in the workplace? And so we in that sense, we're looking forward to their roles and responsibilities and whether the registrar is ready to assume those as opposed to looking backwards and saying well this has, has the student to this date um, picked up the the mastery of the content taught in courses and rotations so a a subtle but definitive shift in how we're looking at the assessments and this is likely to be brought into play um, and uh, on a practical level at the beginning of 2025. We'd aimed for 2024, but at a national level, it looks like we're going to be delaying that. Is there another? Uh, shall we go on to the next slide? Potentially, uh, Tina, if that. Thank you. But colleagues, um, if you think about it, um, the, this this EPA, these units of professional practice around which we need to make an entrustment decision and not by one individual, not by a 
Tina and Grata around an internal medicine registrar becoming a physician, but rather herself within the context of a group of professionals of different levels, of different potentially professions who collectively make a decision, an entrustment decision about the competence of that individual to become an uh, to become a physician within the Helen Joseph context, for example. And the subjectivity of that decision can be um, on of mm. that is with an individual mm. can be, can be made quite objective for being um, for being multiple 360 degree 360 look at the students um, uh, the students entrustability to be a physician. However, um, critically, this the entrustment decision will be taken within, and this has come out of the work of Oli Tenkate out of Maastricht and and other colleagues within the, the Netherlands context. And this is great. This is taking hold in terms of the EPAs around the world, not least in South Africa. And that is that that the now if we are going to make an entrustment decision, it must be an, a rich entrustment decision in which can we 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 need to look to and following the acronym the not only that we need to look to the agency of a, of that registrar um, as to whether they are proactive they work well within a team proactively they look to their own personal development for example they are reliable as in they are conscientious predictable accountable responsible but they display the appropriate hint integrity as well that they're truthful and benevolent the c refers to that that traditional capability the knowledge, the skills, the experience, the situational awareness, which of course they they must have and are traditionally always needed to have. But then that's situated within the A rich framework now, and the H is humility. And that now they must be able to recognize limits. And for me, to be honest, if you'll allow me, Tina, this is my 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 of the my personally my favorite. In that can a registrar ask for for uh, recognize when they need to ask for help, be particularly receptive to feedback and recognize their limits. Because if you're if you think about it, when we're entrusting a, a professional to become a physician or a pediatrician or a family physician, we can't assess them on everything. And there are multiple different contexts in which they, they need to perform. So performing at two o'clock in the morning is very different to performing at two o'clock in the afternoon. And if we can take a rich entrustment decision around their capacity, around them being being able to perform the units of professional practice as a physician, or whichever specialist, then then that is then that it, that would would that really enables our uh, the assessment framework to be able to entrust them to 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 have have um, to have reached the 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 bar of of uh, of achievement as it were. And and in in Tina as myself and and Dr. Pacino, Dr. Makachana's engagement, um, Manta and Laurie. And we've wondered whether this isn't a, something of a of a of a stake in the ground that we can understand from a postgraduate perspective, and and try to bring some of the discussion, <clears throat> if you excuse me, some of the discussion around these very same issues into the into the undergraduate space. For 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 starting to have students thinking through these issues, um, and and how this can impact on the on the partnership between faculty and students. I do want to be very clear, though, that that we've grappled with the fact that there are many senior um, faculty, many senior preceptors, if you'll allow me to say, within the safe space, who themselves, as Professor Richard Cook, um, who um, who may not be very receptive to feedback, who may not ask for help, who may not recognise one my my limits, and there's a lot of faculty development that we're having to do in this very same framework. Um, to be the role models for our students. But can we start the conversation within the within the the undergraduate space and within a within the in in some way, in some practical way, within some framework of engagement that uh, that will will just potentially prepare start to prepare the individuals for the students at an undergraduate level for the professional journey ahead of them. Tina, can I pause there perhaps? Thank you, Richard. And you know, if we're looking at aiming for this in our postgraduates and the concept of us bringing it into the undergraduates, if you look at some of these elements, perhaps they 
they speak to some of the faculty, well, the culture changes we wanted are reflected in some of these learner factors in entrustment with an EPA. So then we wondered how could we, if we were aiming for this, how could we get our students there? What attributes would we need our students to have in order to get there? And one of the key areas is developing a growth mindset in our students. And what's important about this particular stance is it assumes that um, no matter who you are as a student in any training space, that you have the ability to grow. You are not at your best on that moment. You haven't arrived there yet. You are open to feedback and you are willing to be coached and trained so that you can get to the best version of yourself. And I'm not sure how many students have this type of mindset. Getting our students to think out loud and explain their thoughts and explain what's concerning them is a key part to growth because then we can engage with them. We also need our students to be willing to practice deliberately in these skills and us helping them through them and, and working with them through their training spaces. Because health professions can be quite unforgiving. And um, error is, is seen as, as unwanted. And we're asking for a shift to a space where error is allowed for because it is human to err. And error in learning is often seen as undesirable. And we would like to challenge that misconception and to say that in order to develop to the best of your ability, you are going to need to make mistakes and see error as an opportunity to learn from these mistakes. And nobody likes to fail, but we need to change the way we look at failure as, as a different acronym, which is uh, perhaps first attempt in learning. And it implies that you will have further attempts in learning. And this will encourage you to persist because you'll get better going forward. So the difference between a fixed and a growth mindset is a student that adopts a growth mindset embraces challenges. They persist despite obstacles. They learn from criticism and they are inspired by others who are doing well. And they see their effort as more important than the reward. The effort they put in is the key because they, it will get them there eventually. And if we want to get our students to this point, to take on their learning, to take on responsibility, what do we need to be doing as teachers? We need patience because students are not at the level that we're at. And, and often we forget the steps we had to take to get there. We need to encourage students to be vulnerable in our spaces, to allow them to make mistakes in safe ways and to help them through feedback and to guide and coach and mentor. We as faculty need to be open to feedback from our students and be not only willing to guide, I don't know that this is an issue. I think more of a concern is, is openness to, to feedback from students. Some, some people are really good at, at guiding and giving students feedback and, and then put, perhaps fall down when students are opening feedback in the other direction or don't really want to know. And, and I guess what I'm saying is these types of elements are in fact the encouragement of a growth mindset in faculty too. And maybe that's what we should be aiming for, that growth can be had in all parties. Because the truth is, we are all in this together. And the only way we can get better is if everybody is willing to say, I'm open to change, I'm opening to getting to the best version of myself because perhaps I'm not there yet. And how do we get there as a collective? This mindset, this way of being, it needs to become this, this way of thinking about growth and, and fostering trust needs to become a way that we are when we are in our spaces. And we have to accept that we are all always learning, not just the students, but faculty too. That the effort we put in is more important than the results. And that we guide each other's efforts, and that's in both directions. And we need to look at intelligent praise, constructive critique, um, helpful guiding critique. And that honestly, nobody knows everything. And everybody could do with a little bit of supervision and or input. I mean, I, I as, as a teacher, 
I, I don't even remember the last time I asked a peer or a colleague to come and sit in on a session and say, listen, how was that? <laughs> or to get feedback on a difficult interaction perhaps that I had with a patient and the students were there and for them to be honest with me and how that went. I, I don't think I've ever done that. And we expect our students to do it with us every day. But I'm saying if, if we're going to do that with them, then they can expect the same of us. And we need to all hold each other to a higher bar. And I guess the focus is to be on where we're going rather than where we are now. And so I'm, I'm going to finally introduce what we promised we would introduce. And I'm going to put up what is a document which is in draft. And it has changed in, in many times. It's gone through many iterances and it's currently not in its final utterance, utterance, it's got lots of change to be to be brought in. But I, I just want to take you through the process of, of what happened here. So what started as a conversation with me and a colleague on a couch about the unprofessional students became, surely there's a way we can enforce this and started looking at contracts between students and faculty. And that then became a code of conduct and a professionalism code of conduct, which then came with litigation. So it went too far and it came back because the idea is of an agreement is, is that there are two parties involved, maybe three, maybe four, but in this case, two parties involved that both have a set of clearly defined roles and responsibilities about what is expected to be delivered in terms of integrity, humility, reliability, and duty. And what we did with this contract is we adjusted it to become an agreement and embedded the A-rich principles within it. Where we are saying to students and teachers that we strive to develop a relationship that is characterized by mutual trust, acceptance, and confidence. And this is really important in medical training, that trust is earned by teacher and learner. And that we're going to be holding each other to account in professional and ethical values. And a reminder that there's an, there's an understanding that this is something we agreed to. Now, my colleagues can jump in here. And we, we've gone back and forth in various spaces about sort of the legal. I mean, I did, when we started, we wanted this to be something that was signed. And we kind of broached it in January with the students as, as sort of a verbal commitment that we would hold our bit and the students would do their bit. And what's happened so far is nothing has really changed other than the students have looked to the training space with healthy skepticism and fear and found that the fears that they had have come true. And faculty have had the same experience where the students haven't changed in any way. And that is because in our experience with students and they told us this documents don't change behavior. But I'm bringing forward an agreement here and saying, could we come up with a collective understanding of a way that we agree we are going to be and hold each other to account in these spaces? Could that be a way forward? So I'm just going to pause then and allow for my colleagues to comment on bits that I've perhaps left out. Uh, Richard? So thank you, Tina. And, and we took this document and 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 um, brought in some of the A-rich framework, you'll notice um, in the bold, we've got agency reliability, integrity, et cetera, just to try to, to bring in the conversation around or bring in these these concepts into this discussion. But lately can we've I, been can thinking- Can I focus here, Richard, or would you oh, like I beg to your pardon. Is it better um, here or the previous page? Um, this is, yes, no, this is, this is, this is better. This is okay. this is better for us to be looking at, and these are some of the, the <clears throat> that's fine. These these are some of the, the particular phrases and the agreements, so that we we're just trying to grow this 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 um, th use this particular tool to grow the culture of of a partnership around agency reliability and integrity, etc. That speaks to professionalism as a whole. Um, but in our preparation for the this this. Uh, discussion today, colleagues, um, we raised the issue of, of uh, or the question of, of a, on one extreme, we've got a contract as, as Tina was was saying that we pulled back from or went past and came back from you with me, to something not quite as onerous or legal or fearful, fearsome, um, to to an agreement, and one almost at the other extreme wants to say, ask the question, well, 
how do we grow the culture so that none of us have to sign um, because of the fear that comes with that? Um, or do we meet in the middle somewhere? And it's not about a signature, is it? Ultimately, it's about the culture. But is this a tool that can allow us to, 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 to at least, at least show us a particular direction in which we all are wishing to move? Thanks, Tina. I see Mervyn's got his hand up. Um, may I go with Daniela first? Uh, go ahead, and then I'll come to you second, Mervyn. Sorry. Thank you very much. So I like the fact that there's this account, like a framework, an accountability framework. Um, and I like it because the fact that it's something that both are signed, I feel like it regulates the power in some in some uh, way, um, where, you know, for a very long time, the student feels faculty holds most of the power. Um, and in some cases, faculty feel students hold most of the power. Um, and so I, I, I think I, I appreciate uh, what's going on in, 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 in the thinking behind such a document. The question that I would have, uh, seeing what's here, I wonder about um, the, I mean, I, I love the fact that we want to restore the values. It's, it's coming to, you know, the idea of patient centeredness. But my worry would be, you know, how are we going to strengthen this, strengthen this or achieve this? Um, uh, because I'm worried about are we going to get to a point where all our efforts are have an appropriate budget and capacitation for achieving this across board? I know we're talking about doctors, but I'm, I'm assuming, you know, with the fact that it's not just um, doctors, uh, educators who train doctors here, but I, I think about um, in making sure that there's appropriate budgeting and capacitation for, for the programs to achieve this. Um, I mean, last week we talked, what was raised was about tutors and where we sign this agreement and we think about the resources needed to make sure that we assist the students to a growth mindset, the, the student that is, is struggling. Um, and some people, you know, don't have the capacity to do it. Maybe the, the, the units are a bit smaller. Um, and should they, you know, think of um, ways of trying to to meet some of the um, the, the capacity building and, and engaging on reliability? Will there be um, all these other elements uh, afforded should you decide that, yes, I agree that we we work towards this? So that's that's the question that I have is that as a faculty, are we ready, really ready to put, if I could say, put our money where, you know, where, what was, what's the term? Put your money where your mouth is at, I forget, but that's what I'm, I'm trying to, to highlight here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to reply first and then I'm going to give my colleagues a chance to reply. And, and just to say, Daniela, that, um, when we started this project, um, we were really looking at keeping it within the faculty, uh, within the, the School of Clinical Medicine, particularly within the GEMP program. And as we started exploring the topic, it became clear that this was a much bigger problem, not just in one program, but across the board. And currently, you know, the logistics of how to do this, we're, we're nowhere near that. We're currently having conversations about the direction we're going in to start sparking a small fire in various spaces so that individuals can start working in an individual way. Because they, as teachers and faculty members, we don't appreciate our role as an individual in terms of impacting our small environment where we, we have our students. So budget, I don't know. I have no reply there. Um, it's really about sharing an idea and, and getting that idea going that we were looking to do today. But let me let me uh, allow my colleagues to also comment. Uh, but Mervyn had his hand up and I'm going to let him come in there before I allow my colleagues to comment. Go ahead. Thanks very much. This is such a complex issue and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be part of it. You've used a couple of words that for me are of concern. And I know that you've retracted some of them. And the word that particularly jarred for me was 
in force. And certainly this is not something that we want to do. Uh, we, we would choose, in my mind, to encourage rather than enforce. And in getting people to sign an agreement, this in fact is enforcing. We're enforcing them to stick to the rules, whether they have the capability or not, which creates at both levels from a teacher and a pupil point of view, um, a lot of problems. And it hinges around one of the very early words that Richard uh, mentioned, and that is trust. And ultimately everything hinges in my mind around trust and how do we cultivate trust at peer, at senior and at junior level. Um, it's, it's, it's a mindset which I won't say is foreign to us, but with which we have not grown up and into which we are trying to adapt ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mervyn. Anastasia, go ahead. Um, thanks, thanks very much, um, Tina, for and and for this conversation on Prof Cook. I uh, this is really heavy because for me, um, the whole um, sense of having culture and the whole sense of trying to define the environment in which um, we engage um, professionally as teachers and students, as colleagues, as peers, actually very strongly um, has a way of impacting throughput at the end of the day. And, you know, having an excitement to come to work, having an excitement to come to learn, um, literally this boils down to what culture? I mean, I think of um, real life situations, you know, spaces where there's certain spaces where children want to go to. There's certain spaces where learners, you know, feel very comfortable to learn. And it's the intangibles um, that sometimes define those. But what I wanted to just come through with is um, thinking of COVID, when we had COVID, and, you know, um, there had to be a very quick, rapid culture change in terms of putting on masks, washing hands, sanitizing, you know, the very quickly, the one, two centimeter apart stickers on the floor came through very rapidly, testing stations, and, you know, there were very rapid changes within a very short space of time because of the impact um, of COVID. Um, to the population. I think that from a perspective of the psycho, psycho emotional or psychological capital of the learning environment, that this needs to be addressed. And I'm happy that you didn't restrict this to GEMP. I guess that's another culture we need to think about. Not thinking restrictively, but always thinking the, the collective. So for me, I just want to throw out a few suggestions. I know Daniela spoke about costs um, for this. Is it possible that we start having little posters in very prominent places um, that jar um, social media content, whatever, you know, all the things that are available now in our post COVID era that um, make for mass mobilization at short notice? That, that speaks to not the bulk of this agreement, but speaks to one thing at a time. Um, this is this week is the week of agency. What does agency mean? Conversations, tea time conversation, lunch, in, you know, informal things, things that would attract the bulk of the population within the Faculty of Health Sciences, which are the young people, and then draw, uh, draw in um, um, appropriately a faculty as well. What does it mean um, to report facts through the correct channels? How do we interpret that? Um, what is available for that? What does it mean to recognize responsibility um, in developing personal learning goals so that this isn't again um, documents or rhetoric on documents, but actually becomes something 
that um, quickly becomes put on face masks. This is how to wear the masks. This is how to, you know, uh, wash the hands. This is how to sanitize. And then there is a rapid change. Um, those are my comments. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Anastasia. Mantua, go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you, Tina. I'll start by saying good things are free. So if we start with ourselves, with, with humanity in everything that we do, um, as teachers as well, um, it will actually um, do something in the students. So I would say um, costs, um, yes, they may come up later, but we need to start with our own actions, do something different. And maybe um, the, the posters that, that um, Anastasia is talking about, we can start with a big one around humanity before we even go anywhere. Um, yesterday I was saying to, to the team that, yes, there is an age of humility. I think we need to add an age of humanity or humaneness. And I think that's where we need to start. Um, I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mantra. Nabila? Um, thank, thanks, Tina. I think this this draws on so much. And I think my mind was just, I think as um, Anastasia was saying earlier, it, it becomes so heavy. Um, and I'll draw on a little bit of my experience with this topic. Um, part of my, my master's research looked at, you know, the educator's duty to care. And a lot of it was, you know, it's ethical caring. So in bioethics, we talk about ethical caring and we're talking about not caring in the paternalistic way, but caring in a way that empowers students and caring in a way that, you know, the academic equally feels a sense of not just so much responsibility for the student, but a sense of responsibility for the learning of the student and the development and the growth of the student. And I think all of this comes back to, you know, this development of a culture that, that we're trying to do and that we're trying to to encourage and inculcate in each other. And I, I just come back to all of it and I keep thinking, if if we ourselves don't fully understand what our duty is towards educating, then, you know, as students say, an agreement and a piece of paper doesn't always allow for <laughs> for the for policy to be implemented and, and and i mean you know we do need the paper and I, and I won't deny that because i part of what i was looking into was you know a code of a code of ethics for health professions educators and in the world i found one um and and, and i think it's important that we just do a little bit of introspection as educators and yes there are student personality traits and there are students who who we need to reflect on and talk about but I do think as educators, creating a space where, where we can appreciate our duty to teaching, hopefully changes that culture and builds that trust so that when such an agreement comes about, no one doubts why we need to sign something because this is who we are. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's my thoughts. Thank you, Nabila. Um, I've been reading a lot of the comments and reflecting on what's been said, and it is important to note that this is just the start. And I'm going to use Anastasia's analogy with COVID. Um, if we imagine the pandemic as it started um, with a problem that was over there in another continent and it didn't arrive here, that's currently where we are in this process. It's something that a small group of people are looking at and trying to spread further until everybody comes along. There are going to be early adopters and there are going to be late adopters. But I think that the time has come for us as faculty, as a collective at WITS really, to say, we've got to start somewhere. And it may not be ideal. <laughs> you know, we're building this boat as we go. But I, I, I think that we all agree that at an individual level, it is possible to just start somewhere with this, be it sharing an idea, creating further dialogues has been suggested in the chat. And I, I hope that, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up because when we started this process, we were very heavily focused here on, on the patient, on everything that we're doing, 
was to to create the best product we could to look after the patient and that focus has shifted a little bit and I'm, I'm going to ask Mantua to just speak to the next slide because she brought this principle in and it was key for me uh, and and I uh, Mantua I hope you're happy to speak about this principle and and how it came into the space thanks Tina um you took me by surprise then <laughs> but it's fine um I was saying to, to, to the team yesterday that, yes, we, we focused on the patient, but there's a tendency then, um, while doing that, we become quite harsh to our juniors, to our colleagues. A colleague can even collapse because of our action in trying to help the patient. So we need to bring humanity in, in what we do. So yes, it's about the patient, but it's about everybody else, not just the patient. It's about you as the doctor. As someone has said, we need to also um, make sure that we don't get depleted. But it's about your colleague. It's about your, your student. It's about the patient. It's about the people around you at that time, whether it's a cleaner or, or whoever, a nurse, all the people. So if we can then bring humanity to it all, um, we can work together and, and start acting that way. That's why I was saying also, good things are free. You don't have to pay for good things. If you your actions are good, they will rub off onto the next person and change will come. So you start small, you start with one, but that can end up being thousands and thousands of people acting that way. You can even see when you walk around, maybe in the hospital, just greeting somebody, stopping and asking them how they are. That, the smile you see on that person's face. So we need to start doing things like those in the clinical space and not be harsh to the students, the colleagues, when you are busy with a patient that's not well. Um, you can still make sure that that patient is cared for, but again, be kind and gentle, even when you are giving orders to what needs to happen to the patient. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you want more, Tina, but Ubuntu is about I am because we are. So it's not an individualistic thing. It's about a collective. So a collective in this case is everybody. It's a community, including the patient. So we need to be looking at it that way. And I think that way we may be able to change the culture of harshness, of not caring. Um, and maybe mental health issues may come down. You may end up even with less suicides. And a lot of things may change by just starting with small things, being kind to one another, being showing love to one another, taking time to greet and look the person in the face to say, how are you? Um, or, or, or when you greet in Sizulu, you say, Saubona, meaning I see you, you know? And you'll notice when someone is not okay and you can start the conversation of trying to find out what's happening. Maybe they, will not, they won't talk to you about it at that time, but they may, come back and say, by the way, you asked me how I was and I couldn't talk at the time, but now I can talk. So let's bring humanity to it all. It can change so many things. Thank you. Thank you, Mantua. Um, which, which brings us to over the three weeks and over the, the year to sort of a reconceptualization of where we started to, to a, a contract really that we wanted everyone to sign so we could enforce it, to a shift in the culture, to one, a culture of Ubuntu perhaps. Perhaps that's the answer to bring humanity back into the space. And within that, in the curriculum, aiming for a rich with an additional age of humanity tied into this, is that perhaps a way forward? I don't know, but this is where we we might find ourselves looking at things. But what happens now? <laughs> I'm going to say it again and again because it's true. You know, as we as we go, we we change things, we adjust things, and and this is a process. And I'm hoping that we've got more people when we have these conversations that have been thinking about these things and say, yeah, I've thought about that. It's a good idea. Or let's try this. Let's, as an individual, just for the next 28 days, do something with 
humility and humanity and kindness at work and see what happens at an individual level. Really asking for partnership between all party, parties involved for the good of the collective as a shift perhaps for our faculty. And, and at a curriculum level to consider perhaps adapting the curriculum to help us make a rich entrustment decision. And where do we go from here? Well, Richard, I'm going to let you chair this section because um, we have gone over time and I apologize colleagues again, um, as is the case with, with self-reflection. Um, but thoughts and ideas about where to go from here. I see that we have lost Richard, um, which is okay. I, I've I've reflected on the chat, uh, and I yes, Daniela, perhaps you can come in there because I haven't had a chance to read your comments in the chat. Come, go ahead. Um, no, it's it doesn't sound interesting. It just came to mind. I was just reading something about. Um, it came across. I was reading something about governance, and it said public trust equals public accountability, and it made me think of. Perhaps we need to look at a tool or a particular metric in which we we could use to drive accountability within faculty. Because we we're just talking now about um, it's easier to sort of um, uh, kind of hold the students accountable, um, but it's very difficult to hold faculty accountable. And I'm thinking that. You know, once the and if I understand the chat, everyone is in agreement. We we see this, but how do you hold? How do we hold faculty accountable to not driving towards this change? Um, and as much as we, you know, Mervyn said, um, enforce maybe not the right word, um, but I think for a very long time we've been moving with the same engagement of um, hoping that. Our our efforts um, are, are seen and people are drawn to change or are transformed to change um, by interacting with like minded people, um, which I'm assuming this this is the people in in this in this um, in this space and, and and others who aren't in the space, but it's not happening. <laughs> um, and so perhaps a different strategy um, to take is possibly to 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 enforce. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, enforcing doesn't necessarily mean punitive, but um, as I said, taking in this, this something that could look at some form of public accountability. And that's visible to both students and faculty to see, um, you know, is this person, you know, if someone, I don't know whether it's a dashboard, someone can see, um, you know, what are Daniela's activities towards driving, towards change, towards creating this culture um, and that is what then you are judged by and that ensures trust because it's on display it's something we can see it um, i think for a very long time um, unless you've engaged with someone in conversation or served in a committee then you'll know that ah oh, i know somebody who's driving towards a patient-centered approach transforming um you know the culture within the institution um, but that that is that is not the loudest if i can say the loudest voice um, that's not the greatest influence, and it's because perhaps um, it's not given this public platform. Um, that's just my comment. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, Mantua? I'm sorry, Tina. Um, I, I agree. Sorry, um, that where people feel like they're being judged. I, I don't know how we can do it. Um, I don't know how possible it is. The other thing that could be done is what we call lohota. Uh, but then who will be in that lohota? Lohota is people that can then call you in, but not to judge you, but to help you grow and see some of the things that you did wrong and with the hope that you, you will then change. Um, so I don't know when it's like that, which people can you even put in that 
um le khotla group because um it needs to be people that will be able to do that gently kindly um but also still be respected for what they are doing so i don't know how we can do that thank you uh, colleagues um what i'd like to say is that this conversation does need to continue and i i wouldn't like it to end um because these sessions have ended I'm hoping that as individuals, you will take these conversations back to the spaces where you're at and start having them and start saying, how could we shift and change things? And I'd also like to challenge that we don't need everybody to do this perfectly. We need everybody to do this as best as they can. And that starts by a, a small group of people starting and showing others that there is a different way to do things. So I do feel that the role of the individual here is much bigger than we are appreciating. I know that the role of the individual might be scary, but now you're in a shared space with colleagues who are perhaps already on a similar to same page. And we are going to keep having these conversations. And all, all we're asking is that within your own spaces, are there opportunities to bring in these elements that we've highlighted? to focus the role modeling and people want to stick to get things done quickly they want a punitive action but that is not how you change a culture we have to do this slowly and gently over time but with quite a bit of deliberate behavior and and really this agreement you know you know behavior is an interesting thing um it's it's an understanding that you should behave a certain way and you should know how that is and what this agreement is providing is perhaps for those who, who are not clear on what it is that we're expecting or that is expected, that there is a guiding document. <laughs> it's not something to be used as a stick, but more as a guiding document until one day eventually, once we've agreed that this is how we want people to be, then eventually it can be something that is signed. And I think for now, that is not the goal. The goal is at, at taking on responsibility from both sides. And I think the key is to look in your own spaces and, and to say, are there any things that we can use that can encourage people to behave better? Are there things that are already in existing in structure that we're just not using? I'll give an example. Teaching assessments um, insist on feedback and they are necessary in order to academically progress. So, um, insisting that people have teaching assessments would, would have a dual role because it's enforcing feedback and seeing how people are doing which they may not actually have even been aware of so that's sort of a simple existing strategy but i, I think that each each person in the space perhaps has things that they can look at but what we're looking at really what started as as improving on the professional behavior of students has become a, a much bigger endeavor in terms of changing the way that things are for the benefit of all of us and i know this is, sounds like a very lofty task but i i think we've already started and we're all different after having these conversations and i i think that there's power in in, in that colleagues thank you for listening to me and for bearing with us over the last three weeks and for bringing your vulnerabilities and truths and thoughts and ideas here these are safe spaces um if there are any are any other closing comments i am going to close the session now just to say thank you we will provide additional spaces to discuss these things and, and maybe we have to create them maybe that's the way forward um to create these lichotlas that mantra was mentioning or others uh, to to unpack these further and perhaps that's your role is to go and see if you can do that in your own space no pressure but thank you for the time and thank you for the honesty and thank you for for bringing um yourselves and your experiences here good evening and thank you are there any further comments from you? No, I just to say thank you. It was it's quite an enriching um, discussion. And I think we'll be moving forward from here and trying to change ourselves so that our students can also change by looking at what we do and how we act. Thank you. Thank you, Mantra. Uh, Daniela, go ahead. No, I, I wanted to say thank you, but also encourage the team for the past few weeks to write i don't know whether you can write up on on what we've been doing um 
and 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 keep it on record. I don't know, but to also share it with the National Department. I was looking at the Presidential Health Summit, and a lot of the topics we're talking about um, speaks to what they're trying to address with these nine pillars, um, especially with regards to human resources and service delivery. And I think a lot of what we've talked about, and especially today's presentation, um, would be something that they you know they can build on that would address. Um, these supposed nine pillars towards driving um, everybody to being prepared for universal health coverage. So I would really encourage um, that engagement. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, do stay in touch. Um, you know, you know our names, <laughs> and we now know yours. Um, and we'll be connecting in the various spaces going forward. Uh, thank you, and good night.